Uh, if you want to build a road map, the first thing you have to do is to know where you are. Then you determine where you want to go, where you want to be. The next thing, you put in place what you need to do in order to get to where you want to be. And then, having put in place what you want to do, you begin painstakingly to do precisely that thing. And that is what I'm going to discuss with you today. And I'll use an example of what we did uh, when I was at the Energy Commission of Nigeria in the energy sector. Uh, solving the Nigeria's energy problem, it requires adopting an overall position, an overall orientation to development. And I think this present administration has given us that overall orientation. That is, move away from public sector control and go to private sector control. That is our marching order. And then you develop your policies at the overall energy level, subsector level, your laws to support the policies, then your plans, and then you implement. And you implement in a dedicated fashion. Now, as I said before, building a roadmap, know where you're going, how you want to get there. And in the energy sector, it means for us to develop a projection of our energy demand over a certain planning horizon. Having developed that demand projection, then we plan what we have to put in place by way of supply infrastructures in order to meet that demand. Now, energy depends on a number of things. The determinants of energy demand, the drivers of energy demand, then the consumption intensities, how much energy is utilized for a certain product, for a certain uh, quantity of output, and then how much energy penetrates into the different sections of the economy. And the different sections of the economy, agriculture, construction, mining, and so on, household sector, they all have their different drivers. For industry, is the GDP. For transportation, passenger transportation is passenger kilometers, ton kilometers for freight, number of households, and so on. So we need a projection of all of these things over the plan horizon. And in the work that we did, we used a 30-year plan horizon, 2000 to 2030. And to do this, you're looking into the future, means you have to develop scenarios, informed and intelligent scenarios, based on expertise and experience of what the future is likely to be. Now, for the economic scenarios, the GDP, we use three scenarios. A 7% growth rate, which is the uh, needs high growth rate. And then Mr. President, in his dynamic fashion, said he wanted a more industrializing country that will require a higher growth rate than 7%. So the, the, that's how the growth rate of 10% came to be. And then we put in an optimistic scenario greater than the 10%, which is 11.5%. And then to get the kind of uh, economy that you're talking about, you also have to look at the structure. Now, an industrializing economy should be one in which uh, the industrial sector accounts for at least 25% of the GDP. And manufacturing should have not less than 40% of that uh, sector. And then the number of persons employed in manufacturing should be more than 10%. So our structure assumed for the industry sector, which is construction, mining, and manufacturing, to move from around 10% that it is ar around this time, around now, to about 30% at the end of the plan period, which is 2030. Also, another important uh, scenario that you need is how the population is going to grow. Uh, we use the projection based on the 1991 census that by 2005, you should have 132.5 million people. Now, we use the more aggressive decrease in the growth rate over the plan period than the National Population uh, Commission suggested. So going from 2.83 growth rate to 1.8 towards the end of the planning period, and also a projection for the uh, share of the uh, uh, rural sector of this economy. Putting all of these things into this model, the model is actually called a uh, uh, model for analysis of energy demand. It's an international model developed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. From it, we were able to get, in energy terms, tons of oil equivalent, the projected energy demand for the entire economy over the plan period. It indicates, for instance, that for the reference growth rate, which is 7%, we should be going from about 30-something tons of oil equivalent to uh, about 180. 
that is a growth rate of about a factor of about six. And for the optimistic growth rate, it should increase by a factor of about 10 or 11, something like that. That's the upper curve. Now we were, okay, this is the growth that we projected for the non-commercial fuel, that is fuel wood and all that. The important thing there is that we projected that we ought to put in place policies and programs that will decrease the contribution of fuel wood to the energy consumption uh, over time. So that's why the curve went up slightly and then started decreasing later. We were also able to extract from all these projections the implications in natural units for the fuels that we use. PMS, for instance, were able to project that by 2005, yes, 32.45 million liters per day, increasing by a factor of five by the year 2030. And we also made projections for the other uh, uh, energy types that we utilize normally. The same thing applied to electricity, and that's very crucial to us. It means from our projection that at the reference scenario, by 2030, if we want to be industrializing, we should be producing about 120,000 megawatts. We are, I think about 4,000 megawatts is the available capacity now. It tells you what we still have to do. But it's interesting that by 2010, the model does indicate that we should be producing about 15, 16,000 megawatts of electricity. The president's project, pr present plan is for us to have 15,000 megawatts by, 20, uh, by 2010. And at least in the short term, we seem to be uh, on the right path. Uh, now, having gotten the projected demand, remember what we said about uh, uh, roadmap building, where you want to go, how you want to get there. For instance, we take up electricity. What do we have to put in place in order to ensure that we do have the megawatts we're talking about at the times that we need them? That brought us to the use of another model called Generation Expansion Plan. Uh, it's called WASP, it's in another international model. It will tell us how much of electricity we must develop from the different available energy technologies, that is whether it be gas, whether it be hydro, whether it be nuclear, and so on, and at what point in time we should have those plants coming into operation. This was done, and uh, the result we have is indicated there for the reference scenario. It's telling us that most of our power plants must come from gas. I believe this is what we already know, isn't it? But it, it's good that the model you know, is also following that. And now, what is also very interesting is that what we have been doing so far relating to coal, utilization of coal, is not wise. If we want to optimize our electricity generation strategy, we ought to pay a lot more attention to the utilization of coal than we are doing right now. And <laughs> it also is telling us that nuclear power should become important in the short term. So by 2015, we should be bringing in nuclear power. And actually, that has informed the federal government, beginning now, to put in place uh, a roadmap for bringing nuclear power into the generation mix. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you've got one thick-headed professor here. You took my thing away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, one of the implications from this, in respect of gas, well, in respect of the electricity sector is we require a lot of money, 450 to 500 billion dollars over the plan period in order to give us what we want. It is clear the government can do this. So we must bring in, exactly, where will it come from? We must bring in other participants in the investment uh, team other than government. And that is another justification for the program that the government is implementing now in the electricity sector, opening it up for private investments. Um, the other implication about the role of gas is that we have to do something special about gas. It shows that gas component of the uh, energy we, uh, electricity we need is about 63 to 85 percent over the period. And it's also important for us to realize that presently, 
Most of the gas power plants are located in the Delta region, which is also where the uh, gas sources, gas generation and gas networks are concentrated. The, the dotted lines indicate planned extensions of the, of the gas network. Now, this is not good. The concentration of gas power plants in one area is unstable and gives you a very fragile grid. There is network congestion, frequent system collapses, huge losses of high-grade energy, voltage, low voltages, especially in the northern regions. So we have to do something special about that. That means an integrated development of both power and electricity. And I'm glad to say that this initiative is already taking place. Actually, the total gas we will need between 2006 and 2030 in order to meet the demands of the power sector, even at the high growth rate, is only about 30% of the reserves we have now. So it is not the availability of the reserve that is the problem. It's putting in place the infrastructure, making arrangement for the investments, and how to get the gas to where it will be needed. Also, we, don't have, we should not concentrate the, gas power, I mean the power plants in one area. That means developing uh, a gas network. Like I said, a gas to power program is already uh, being uh, put in place in the office of the special advisor to Mr. President on Energy, that is Professor Debulubwe, and he has a program containing all these five different components. Phase one is actually developing the various instruments that you need in order to develop the projects, and then the last phase is the implementation of the Thank project. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You very much. Thank you very much.